So good afternoon. Welcome to the online Geneva Trade and Development Workshop, which is a seminar series jointly organized by the CEPR, the Geneva School of Economics and Management, the Graduate Institute Geneva, UNCTAD, and the WTO. For today's seminar, I'm delighted to introduce Penny Goldberg from Yale University, who will present trade and informality in the presence of labor market frictions and regulations. The presentation will last one hour and will be followed by 15 minutes of questions and answers. During the presentation, please feel free to ask clarifying questions in the Q&A window. And with the help of my co-hosting colleagues, I will try to relay them uh, to Penny. So without further ado, Penny, the floor is yours for an hour. Uh, thank you very much, Monica. So let me uh, share my screen. Oops. Sorry. Okay, can you see it? Okay, so um, as Monica uh, said, the paper uh, I will present is called Trade and Informality in the Presence of Labor Market Frictions and Regulations. And it's a joint work with uh, Rafael Di Carneiro, uh, Costas Meyer, and Gabriel Ulisseo. So uh, the, the presentation is based on a paper that's very long and very technical. Um, I, one hour is not enough to go into all the details. So I will refer you uh, for the details. I will refer you to the paper that's posted on our website. And for all the technical details, I will refer you to the appendices. Um, what I'll try to do in this one hour is give you an overview of the model and of the issues that we can address with this model. And I hope that at the end, I can convince you that informality is a first order issue that uh, trade economists should focus on. Um, so uh, the point of departure for this work is the observation that informality is a major feature of labor markets in developing countries. Um, so to give you an idea in, in Latin America, it uh, ranges between 35% uh, in Chile to 80% in Peru. So the fraction of the labor, uh, the, the labor force that's informal. Um, in Brazil, which is the country that this paper focuses on, it's about 50%. Um, and moreover, this is a feature that has proven to be resilient to liberalization, to trade liberalization, and, uh, and, and to growth. So, so originally, there was this view that as countries grow, as they become richer, um, informality would go down. And it's true that in high-income countries, informality is relatively low. On the other hand, in many countries, in many uh, lower income countries, we saw a very rapid increase in aggregate income over the last few decades, um, but we didn't see a substantial decrease in informality. Um, again, an extreme case is India. Uh, in India, the percentage of informality is above 90%, despite fast growth in the last two decades. And in Latin America, many countries have grown fast. Certainly many countries opened up to trade in the last few decades, and still the uh, percentage of labor force that's informal remains very high. Uh, broadly speaking, informality is an attempt to uh, bypass uh, many government regulations, so including taxes, minimum wages, other bureaucratic complications. Um, so this is um, uh, uh, often one way that firms use to evade taxes. At the same time, uh, informality has also been very important to labor economies because jobs, informal jobs, are generally considered to be jobs uh, that have lower quality. Uh, so despite the, the fact that um, uh, informality is such a ubiquitous feature of development, there is relatively little work in trade that focuses on informality. Um, and uh, th there are some exceptions that I will briefly describe here, but, but uh, uh, the majority of trade papers uh, tend to focus on the formal sector, and this is partly due to practical considerations. So by, by its nature, informality tends to be invisible to governments and to a certain extent invisible to economists. We don't have very good data sets capturing informality. And therefore, naturally, most of the work has focused on the formal sector. Um, a few exceptions um, in include my own work with Nina Pouchnik early in the 90s, where we looked at, at Latin American countries. Um, 
uh, trying to see whether there was any evidence that trade liberalizations led to an increase in informality. This was a general concern expressed at the time. And the results were very mixed. More recently, there are two papers that, that actually motivated this work. So one is a, a more recent paper by McCade and Pouchnik um, uh, from 2017, where they focus on Vietnam. And what they show, Vietnam experienced a very rapid trade liberalization and bilateral trade liberalization when it opened up to um, exporting to the United States. And what um, uh, Brian and Nina show in their paper is that this process uh, led to, a, to, to the onset of a structural transformation where many farmers moved from the informal agricultural sector to formal manufacturing. So they find that uh, trade liberalization opening up to trade in Vietnam uh, led to um, a substantial increase uh, uh, channeling of resources towards the formal manufacturing sector. Um, that's, uh, that's one paper. Uh, on the other hand, we have work on Latin America, so some work by my uh, current co-authors on this paper, that focuses on the unilateral trade liberalization of Brazil. And there they actually find that uh, opening up to trade may lead to an increase in informality in the long run. So there is a, a paper by De Carneiro and Kovac, actually several papers by them, that um, exploit regional variation. Uh, uh, so the, the differential exposure of different regions in Brazil to the trade liberalization. And they show that um, what happened in Brazil is in the short run, the regions that, that were more exposed to trade liberalization experienced an increase in unemployment. However, in the long run, um, unemployment declined, so employment levels returned to their former level, but there was an increase in informality. And uh, that led them to the hypothesis that perhaps informality acts as a buffer when countries are faced with uh, trade liberalization. So without informality, uh, unemployment might be higher. And, and their finding is also reinforced in a paper by Pochnik and Ulisea, where they exploit the same experiment, the same trade liberalization in Brazil, but they also look at enforcement. And they find that those regions that were uh, stricter in enforcing uh, regulations against informality, these regions experience more unemployment. So again, their results suggest that uh, there may be a trade-off between unemployment and informality when a country is exposed uh, to trade liberalization. Um, all these studies are based on different dips. So um, uh, uh, they study uh, the labor market in, this, uh, in these countries, Vietnam or Brazil, um, based on, on regional variation or on sectoral variation. Uh, however, by their nature, uh, they cannot, they don't allow any statements uh, about aggregate effects, about how the economy was, was affected as a whole. And also they don't allow any statements about welfare effects uh, of these policies. So given this, um, our motivation, our initial motivation for this paper was to provide a framework that can be used to analyze the effects of trade liberalizations in the presence of informality. Um, so, um, what we do in this paper is we develop such a framework. Um, as we're going to see in, uh, in a moment, we think this framework is quite general. So it's very natural to apply to trade liberalization. But in principle, one can apply to many other questions that are important um, in public finance. Um, and uh, more generally, it speaks to, to, to the general question that institutions are important. They've been shown to be important in, almo in almost every field of economics. Um, in trade in general, we tend to abstract from institutions. We don't pay much attention to the institutional setup when a country liberalizes. And this paper, among other things, makes the point that the institution of informality in this case is quite important and needs to be, to be taken into account. So uh, before I go on, let me briefly um, define formally informality. Uh, there are many uh, definitions that one can use, you know, depending on the country you focus on, but generally speaking, informality means that firms or workers engage in activities that are invisible to the government. So um, in the case of Brazil, one advantage that we have by working in Brazil is the data allows, the data we're going to use, um, allow for a very precise uh, definition of informality. So informal firms are those firms that do not register with the tax authorities. Uh, informal workers 
are going to be the workers who are not covered by labor regulations. In Brazil, uh, the workers who have a formal contract ha ha also have a, a card, a, a labor card. Uh, uh, I put up on the screen the Brazilian uh, term, the Portuguese term for this, uh, for this card. And so if a worker does not have such a card in our data, then we consider him or her to be an informal worker. Uh, why is informality uh, potentially important? Uh, so the first reason is that these firms, as I mentioned, and, and workers do not pay taxes. And uh, uh, that in turn means they may hinder the provision of public goods. We won't have much to say about this aspect in this paper simply because we are, we are not focusing uh, on, on the provision of, of public goods, but this is an issue that um, is uh, important in public finance. Uh, the second one is informal firms tend to be very small intuitively because larger firms uh, can be more easily caught by the government. And that uh, means that they tend to contribute to the misallocation of resources. Um, so uh, they lead uh, to, to size dependent distortions that have received a lot of uh, attention in economics. And our paper will have a lot to say about this. Mm -hmm. um, third, uh, informal workers do not have unemployment insurance. They don't have benefits. They don't have social security contributions and they don't have job stability. Um, we are not going to model uh, risk uh, or insurance in this paper. So, however, we'll have a little bit to say about job quality in the sense that, do, that we do take, we do focus on unemployment and we do compute welfare measures by taking unemployment into account. Um, so I will come to that later, but um, this is another reason for now, this is another reason that informality could potentially be important. Uh, so these are all reasons uh, that policymakers have traditionally considered informality to be undesirable. They, they, they actually consider it to be anathema to development. However, informality may also provide de facto more flexibility to firms and to workers to cope with adverse shocks. I mean, this was the hypothesis in these papers by Di Carnero and Tulisea, namely that when a country is faced with a trade liberalization or with an adverse demand shock, informality may give firms uh, some more flexibility to adjust. So there the, the could potentially be a trade-off in welfare when, when we take these considerations into account. Our approach is going to be as follows. So um, informality itself is an institution that's the result of a bunch of domestic distortions. So you can think of this paper as being a paper which is about trade and trade liberalization in the presence of domestic distortions. But we're not going to model the effect of um, its domestic distortion by itself. So instead, we are going to look at the effect of these domestic distortions cumulatively in shaping informality. The, and so in other words, we're going to take this institution that we call informality as given. We are going to model it as the result of these domestic distortions. And then we'll consider what its implications are for the way we judge trade liberalization. So the way we do that is by building an equilibrium model for those of you who know the paper by Kosar, Gunner, and Taibout in uh, 2016 in the AER, uh, our model is, is a model that builds on them. Their model doesn't have informality, but it has unemployment. We focus on informality. And uh, you know, uh, very briefly, here is an overview of the model. So it's a, it's a model with heterogeneous firms. These firms choose to operate in the informal sector or the formal sector. If they operate in the informal sector, they can be caught. Uh, also, there are other disadvantages. They may not have access to formal finance. They cannot export. Um, on the other hand, they can enter the formal sector. In that case, uh, they have access to formal finance and they can export. However, they are subject to regulations and to all the bureaucracy that one faces in Brazil. Um, workers uh, face certain matching frictions in the labor market. Uh, we uh, uh, consider a very rich institutional setting. So in our setting, the government imposes minimum wages. There are firing costs, which are uh, significant in Brazil. There are payroll taxes and value added taxes. And on the trade side, there are import tariffs. Importantly, all these regulations and the taxes, so all these labor market regulations and the taxes are imperfectly enforced by the government. And this imperfect enforcement um, 
leaves the possibility open for firms to and workers to operate as informal. So in other words, informality is the result of having all these regulations and all these frictions in the labor market in conjunction with the fact that all these regulations are imperfectly enforced. Uh, international trade has um, uh, uh, several effects in this model. Um, one effect is directly through imports. Uh, imports affect all firms in the economy through the aggregate demand and through price indices, and also through input and output links. And also uh, trade enters the model through exports. Uh, so, so here our model is very similar to Mellit. So firms uh, need to pay a fixed cost in order to enter export markets. Uh, and uh, trade liberalization affects the allocation of firms into export. Okay, so this is briefly the model. We are going to estimate the model using several data sources from Brazil. Um, let me very briefly describe these data sources. And again, there are more details in the paper. Um, and, then, uh, and then once we have estimated this, uh, this model using, using the, the data sources that we'll describe in a minute, we use it to perform many counterfactual simulations that allow us to assess the effects and quantify the effects of trade in the presence of a large informal sector. And essentially the question we're interested in is twofold. Number one, does the informal sector make a difference? So in other words, do predictions of standard trade models change once you account for the informal sector? And our answer is going to be yes, in many cases, in many, some predictions are going to be robust, but some predictions importantly change. And then second, to the extent that they change, um, how do they change? What are the effects? And among other things, one of the questions we're particularly interested in is this trade-off between informality as a source of inefficiency and informality as, as a buffer, as an employer buffer. Okay, so let me give you a very brief overview of the data sets. Um, we have a total of seven data sets we use. Five of them focus on the formal sector. And these are the uh, RISE, this is a um, matched employer employee data set um, that captures the universe of the formal sector in Brazil. This data has been used extensively in empirical work, so many of you may already know it. Uh, then there is customs data, it's X, and we use the customs data together with RISE to identify exporters. Then we have three firm level surveys, the PIA, PIS, and PAC. So these surveys contain uh, data on revenues and inputs. And again, they focus only on the formal sector. So these data sets, these five data sets, give us a very comprehensive picture of the formal sector. And not surprisingly, they have been used extensively in prior work, also in trade. What about the informal sector? So uh, again, the advantage of Brazil is that we have some good data, not perfect data, but some good data on the informal sector. And one of them is a SINF. Uh, very briefly, a synth, you can think of a synth as being the equivalent of rice in some sense, but for small firms, for firms up to five workers. Um, it's a survey that captures both formal and informal firms. Um, so we have this way info, uh, information on informality. So firms are asked about their informality status, and they're also asked whether individual workers uh, are former or informal. Uh, importantly, a synth is available only for one uh, year, 2003, and this is one of the reasons our, our work is focusing on this year only, 2003. We focus on steady states only. I will argue that uh, I don't have time to go uh, into this in detail, but we can talk about this later. 2003 is actually a good year to consider Brazil to be in a steady state. Uh, but the main reason we focus on 2003 is because this is the one year for which we have very detailed data on informality. And then on the worker side, we have the PME, which is a household survey capturing workers. And this is a survey that reports whether or not the, the worker has the card I talked about. So this allows us to also capture informality on the worker side. And this survey allows us to capture transitions of workers between um, uh, various uh, employment statuses and also formality and informality. Um, there, naturally, you may be concerned about the quality of uh, the information that considers informal firms. Uh, uh, 
one would expect informality to be underreported. Uh, Brazil tends to have a very good reputation in terms of the information they collect about informality. And this is partly due to the fact that they guarantee privacy and confidentiality of the data. So the information they collect through NSYNF cannot be used to audit firms or to uh, hold them accountable for uh, tax evasion. And finally, I have to tell you that uh, whatever limitations there is in the data, we still estimate the fraction of the labor force that's informal to be around 48%. So that's a very high percentage. So if you think informality is underrepresented, uh, informality could in reality be even higher than that. That's a, that's a very high fraction and that's one reason we should focus on that. So um, now let me stop briefly here. That's a good point to stop, to take questions. And then I can, um, I, I, will, I will present the model. Okay, so there is one question from uh, Marcelo Olareaga. Uh, who is wondering whether informality could also be a source of efficiency in the sense that uh, if regulations are too stringent, informality may help allocate resources more efficiently. Oh, that's, that, that's an excellent question. And there is a similar question that people ask in the context of corruption. <laughs> um, and uh, so I have uh, sympathy for this point of view for uh, many developing countries. Uh, that are faced with excessive regulations where people view corruption as a way of greasing the wheels and getting things done that you cannot uh, get done otherwise. And, you know, with, with uh, informality, one could potentially say the same thing. That said, um, so I can give you the empirical answer. We can look in the data um, about, uh, we can look in the data of whether or not the average formal firm uh, is as uh, or that the average informal firm is as productive as the formal firm. And the answer is there is a very large productivity gap. So on average, uh, formal firms tend to be much more productive than informal firms. And this is partly a function of size. You know, in productive firms tend to grow. In order to be informal, you need to remain small. So to the extent that you want to remain in, invisible to the government, you have to remain small. And naturally, this is going to uh, put limits on how efficient you can be. However, I also have to say that um, in the data, we also see an overlap in the productivity distributions of formal and informal firms. So there are some formal firms that are less productive than informal firms. And there are also some informal firms that are more productive than some formal firms. And presumably these informal firms that are more productive are the ones that, that Marcelo has in mind. So there are presumably those that use informality as a way of bypassing uh, burdensome or unreasonable regulations. And uh, despite their size, they can still be highly productive. Thank you. There are no other questions so far. Okay, so let me um, continue with an over... Uh, oh, actually, before I go to the model, let me... Uh, if you read the paper, we present the model first. Um, and then we, we always get many questions why we made the modeling choices we made. Um, so uh, uh, to address some of these questions, let me reverse the order here and start with some uh, stylized fact, uh, facts regarding informality. Uh, so many of them are well known are, or are intuitive, but I want to highlight them because these facts informed the construction of the model. So in other words, the model we built we make sure that it matches these five facts that we consider to be important. So the first fact is that Brazil has a very large informal sector, as I mentioned, 48% of employment. And now comes the most important, one of the most important facts. Transitions from unemployment to informal are more than twice as likely as transitions from unemployment to formal. Okay. So if a worker becomes unemployed, it's much more likely that this worker will, will get employment in the informal sector than in the formal sector. So this is, you can uh, easily see how this is going to be important when we judge the effects of trade liberalization. So we want to make sure that our model can generate this fact. The second fact is that the probability that the firm is informal declines sharply with its employment size. So in other words, large firms tend to be formal on average, small firms, tend to be informal. Uh, fact three, informal firms are on average less productive than formal firms. This is what I also mentioned in response to Marcelo's question, you know, that these again are facts that refer to averages. 
Fact four, the average informal worker is paid lower wages than the average formal worker. And finally, uh, fact five is again very important in our setting. Turnover, firm level turnover tends to decline with firm level employment size. So larger firms tend to have lower turnover, but condition on size, exporters tend to have higher turnover. This is something that's also documented in the paper I mentioned before by Gossar, Garner and Talbot, and it's quite important. So facts one, one and five uh, together link trade uh, link unemployment, link train to unemployment, and then unemployment to informality. So they're going to be crucial uh, for our model. So let me show you briefly what you know fact five looks like. So we can regress, we can construct a variable that captures turnover. So the weight turnover is defined. It captures both expansions and contractions. And it, we can regress this variable on an intercept the size of the firm, that's the log, the log uh, Li, and an exporter dummy. And we do that separately for the manufacturing sector, that's the C sector, and for the service sector. And so we consistently uh, find that, oops, I'm sorry. We consistently find that larger firms have um, a lower turnover that applies, that applies both to the manufacturing sector and to the service sector. And, but then condition on size, exporters, this is this coefficient here, exporters have higher turnover, okay? So this is going to be important. I will remind you of this fact uh, uh, later when I come to the model. So now let, let me come to the model. So uh, some elements of this model are going to be, uh, you know, very well known to a trade audience. So I will, I will go fairly fast over them. We, uh, assume that the economy is populated by homogeneous, infinitely lived workers, consumers. Um, there are two goods in this economy, a manufacturing uh, good, that's C uh, in our notation, and services, S. And each of them is a composite uh, that's uh, uh, given by this CES aggregate. Uh, in each sector, there are N uh, varieties and C varieties in the manufacturing sector and, and S varieties in the service sector. Um, we are, as I mentioned earlier, we focus on steady states. So from now on, I'm going to uh, drop the subscript uh, T. Um, the uh, subscript K in our notation refers to sectors. Okay. And these uh, sectors, these sector goods are produced by heterogeneous firms. Each firm produces a unique variety using two inputs, labor, L in our notation, and intermediate inputs, this is I, K. And these inputs are combined according to this Cobb Douglas production function with constant returns to scale. Now these intermediate inputs are themselves um, uh, a combination of goods in the manufacturing sector and services. And Importantly, each of them, again, so the, the manufacturing sector, sector, sector aggregate and the service aggregate is a CS aggregate of tradable and non-tradable varieties. So imports, you know, jumping ahead, imports are going to enter the model here in the open economy version of this model uh, through intermediate inputs, intermediate inputs that are imported. And they're, uh, they're, they're one channel through which trade is going to affect this economy. Uh, productivity follows an AR1 process given by uh, this equation down there. And then uh, we can consider the, the problem of the firm. So let me start uh, with, the, with the incumbents first. Uh, we can, there are two, two types of incumbents. There are the informal firms and then the formal firms. Okay, so again, to remind you, K is going to be manufacturing or services. So consider an informal firm operating in sector K. Okay, so this uh, firm starts in period T with the value function V. The value function has two arguments, productivity Z and employment size L. So there are three, this firm has three choices. It can stay informal, it can exit, or it can become formal. Okay, if it becomes informal, then it chooses its employment size. This is L prime. 
Then it makes profits. This is pi. The, the profits are going to be a function of productivity, the previous period labor and the current period uh, labor, L prime. The reason you have uh, both L and L prime entering here is because, as you'll see in a moment, they are hiring and firing costs. Okay, so that, that uh, generates dynamics in the model. Then it draws a new productivity, draws Z prime, and then it starts in period T plus one with a new value function that has takes as arguments Z prime and L prime. Okay, now consider the formal firm. The formal firm faces a, a similar problem. It can stay formal or it can exit. And then if it stays formal, it makes again similar decisions as uh, the informal firm. So uh, a, a formal firm can actually become informal. We don't let it here. We don't uh, allow for this to, to, to happen directly, but the formal firm can exit, then it stays out of the market for one period, and then it can re-enter as an informal firm. So that possibility is accounted for in the model. Uh, so that, that were the incumbents. Now consider entry. We assume free entry. So there is a mass of MK of entrance. Uh, in order to enter sector K, they have to pay an entry cost, and then they draw um, a productivity, draw Z from an ergodic distribution of productivity. And there are three possibilities. Once uh, firms, once the potential entrant has seen the draw Z, one is immediate exit. The other one is to enter the informal sector with size one. And the other one is to enter the formal sector with size one as well. Now, if they uh, enter either sector, then they choose the labor size, the employment size of the firm, and then they realize profits. And then, uh, you know, again, it's the, the problem is very similar to what I showed you before. They draw a new productivity draw, and then they start the next period with a value function. Uh, now, what do the profit functions look like? Okay, so this is where the meat of the paper is. So let me go over this um, in more detail. Uh, so the profit functions of a formal firm take the following form. There is a value added in each sector, which as I showed you is a function of productivity and the current labor si employment size. Importantly, formal firms pay taxes. So this is this tau y here. Think of those as being value added taxes. Then you know they pay some fixed cost and then they have variable costs. What are these variable costs? So these variable costs, uh, are going to be different depending on whether the firm expands, that means it hires workers, or it stays as is or contracts, in which case it may have to fire workers. If it hires workers, so if it expands, then the variable costs have two components. One is the current wage costs, and the current wage costs um, are the, the wage bill to the current workers, but actually, the, in, in its wage setting, the firm is constrained by the minimum wage. So the wage it can pay is the max between the market wage and the minimum wage. And firms also, formal firms, face payroll taxes. So we also need to take those into account. Okay. Um, so this happens if uh, th this is the, these are the costs for the current labor force, and then the firm also faces costs of hiring. This is this term here that I will explain in a moment. So this is if the firm expands. On the other hand, if the firm contracts, then again, this component, the, the cost to the current employment, uh, uh, to the current workers are going to be the same as before. But in Brazil, there are very high firing costs. So this firm needs to also pay firing costs, which we assume are linear in the number of workers that are fired. Okay, so uh, this, this is the profit function of the formal firm. And now uh, let's contrast this to the, prof to the profit function of the informal firm. Okay, again, the, the informal firm uh, has this value added, it pays fixed costs, and it has some variable costs that are going to be different from those of the formal form, uh, for firm. Uh, but um, it also faces a particular cost, the cost of informality. This is this component here that, um, that I will explain in a moment. So let me start with the variable cost first. Uh, what do the variable costs look like for an informal firm? Uh, again, the firm pay, pays the wage bill, but in contrast to the formal firm, this firm does not need to pay payroll taxes. 
okay? And it's not constrained by the minimum wage. So that part is different. And it faces hiring costs as before, but if it fires workers, then it doesn't have firing costs. Okay, so you can see the differences to the uh, formal firm. There are no taxes, so there are no taxes on the value added. There are no taxes, there are no payroll taxes. There is no minimum wage and there are no firing costs. However, there is a cost to informality, and this cost to informality is this red term here, the term in red. And what are the costs to informality? So firms may be caught, in which case they may have to, be, uh, they may have to pay penalties or even uh, uh, be shut down. But even if this doesn't happen, there is also an, an opportunity cost of being informal. So as I mentioned earlier, informal firms cannot export. You cannot export if you're not registered, and they may not have access to, to formal finance. Okay, so there is this trade-off. Uh, we assume monopolistic competition with intermediate inputs. So, and then you can go through the usual uh, algebra with monopolistic competition and CS uh, utility, and then you, uh, uh, you get the, uh, an expression for the value added that has uh, this form. So there is uh, a term here that we call psi, and you can think of this as being an aggregate demand shifter. And this aggregate demand shifter is going to depend both on the price index of, manufacture, of manufactured goods and the price index of services. So the reason I emphasize that is because that's, uh, that, that's one way in which trade is going to enter this model. Um, what are the hiring costs? So I mentioned the hiring costs before. The hiring costs uh, play an important role in this model. Um, they, we assume this function of form, which is um, standard in this literature. Um, the uh, mu here is the probability of filling a vacancy in sector K and in firm type J. Um, the H and the gammas are parameters to be estimated. And let me just briefly say the following. The gamma parameters are important in our framework because depending on their uh, values, uh, the model may be able to generate some of the facts that I mentioned earlier, namely the fact number five, that firm level turnover declines with firm size. That's important in our case. So that depends on uh, the parameter gamma K1. And also, depending on the values of these parameters, we may or not may uh, be able to generate wage dispersion across firms. And again, this is important if you want to relate the, finding, the findings to wage inequality, you need a model that can generate wage inequality. Um, importantly, we don't impose these parameters, we estimate them, right? But uh, as it turns out, the estimates actually allow us to generate fact five and it also, they also generate this wage dispersion I talked about. On the worker side, we assume uh, <clears throat> random, the, the search, uh, uh, it's a search and matching model. Uh, we assume random matching. So workers are matched to firms and vacancies randomly. And then once they are matched, wages are determined by Nash bargaining. This is a case where there are search frictions. And that means that informal and unproductive firms are able to keep workers at lower wages, okay, as long as, as these wages are above the, the reservation wage. Um, if a firm wants to, to hire, what happens is the, the firm will post a vacancy, right? And then um, we assume that the firm, that these uh, vacancies are filled according to a matching function. This is the matching function here. And the matching function, the matching is going to, the matches that actually occur are going to depend on the total number of vacancies that are available in the economy. So this is this sum here, these are the vacancies that are available in each sector and on the unemployment, on the total unemployment, that's LU, and also some parameters that we actually take from the literature. Uh, one more assumption I want to, to mention because it's um, important for interpreting the model. Uh, the matches in each sector we assume are proportional to the relative number of vacancies they post. Okay? And what this means is that the probability of filling a vacancy ultimately does not depend is not sector or firm type specific. It's the same for all firm types. And the reason this is important is it highlights the fact that in our model, all firms in the uh, manufacturing sector, in the service sector, formal and informal, they all compete for the same pool of workers. 
Okay. On the on the uh, 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 trade side, we assume a small open economy, uh, so meaning the aggregate conditions abroad are fixed, and also the set of imported goods is fixed. Uh, the manufacturing firms choose how much uh, to export. In as I said, this is a Mellitz model, so in order to enter the export market. Uh, firms need to pay a fixed cost FX. And then the export decision um, is standard. So firms will enter the export market if the value added net of fixed cost exceeds the value added they would have if they remained domestic. So again, to remind you, there are two main channels through which trade enters the model. There is the export channel, that's a Mellitz type effect. And then it also enters through intermediate inputs and the IO linkages. Um, and that means you know, also the uh, service sector and informal sector firms are affected. Uh, we can actually uh, uh, look at the problem of the exporter and, uh, and solve for the value added of exporters. And then the value added of exporters can be written in this form. Um, I'm sure you, know, <laughs> you don't have, um, you know, it's impossible to digest the notation in this talk, but let me just highlight one uh, one one issue that you know one aspect of this expression that's important: the value added of exporters is equal to the value added that the domestic firm would have multiplied by this term, and this term is greater than one. So what this means is that the the value added of exporters relative to domestic producers is magnified, is larger, but this also means that they are more sensitive to shocks, to productivity shocks or other types of shocks. And their value added is more uh, sensitive. And that means also their hiring and firing decisions are more sensitive. And this generates this fact that I talked about before, fact five, namely that exporters tend to have higher turnover. Okay. Um, uh, very briefly, uh, the equilibrium conditions are as follows. Firms act optimally and make entry, exit decisions, and post uh, vacancies. I already mentioned we have free entry. The wages solve the bargaining problem between workers and the firm. Labor market's clear, good market's clear. Uh, government budget is uh, balanced. Uh, there is balanced trade. And we focus on the steady state, meaning the distribution of firms, the number of firms, and the number of workers in each, in each sector are stable. So this is the model. And let me now briefly mention uh, how uh, 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 th this model, how this model um, uh, is uh, accounts for the effects of trade on informality. So we uh, have several mechanisms, and these mechanisms are going to generate different effects of trade on informality. Uh, as you're going to see in a moment, these effects often push in different directions. So one thing that we actually like from an empirical point of view, this is a highly stylized model, but still, um, if, you, if, if, you, if you look through these mechanisms, it's not clear what happens when an economy uh, opens up to trade. These effects can go in many different directions. And that means that ultimately what happens is an empirical question. So we need to actually estimate the model. It's not a case where the theory dictates the direction of the effect so that in the end as an empirical economist you say why bother with empirical work right so it's really ultimately an empirical question what happens so what are these mechanisms so uh, broadly speaking there are two types of mechanisms the first type we call Mellitz type effects and what we mean by that is that the thresholds for entry and formalization change the productivity thresholds so here there is i'm going to employ a slight abuse of language. So I'm going to talk about productivity and this is just to give you intuition because if I were to be accurate, the value functions, as you remember, they uh, depend both on productivity and also on employment size, right? But here I'm going to focus on productivity. So we're going to have, we have two types of trade costs in the model. We have tariffs and we have iceberg trade costs. And if we have trade liberalization, so if this trade costs decline, then the demand for purely domestic firms goes down, but it increases for exporters. And what this means is that the least productive formal firms exit, 
But in this model, they may be replaced by informal firms. They don't necessarily exit markets completely. They may be replaced, uh, they, they exit the markets, but they may be replaced by informal firms. So that could potentially increase informality. At the same time, though, the least productive informal firms exit, and that would tend to decrease informality. So the effect there could be ambiguous. Then along the same lines, uh, trade also decreases the price of intermediates, and that means it increases labor productivity. So that, again, means that the most productive informal firms may grow and formalize, and that would tend to decrease informality. But at the same time, there is higher income and demand, so that uh, will increase the entry uh, uh, threshold for low productivity informal firms, so that may increase informality. So the effects can go either way, depending on how these thresholds move, which is an empirical question. And again, to remind you, we have for each sector two thresholds, you know, one for being formal and informal, and the other one for entering or not entering. And then we have these thresholds, we allow them to be separate for manufacturing firms and for service sectors. So this is the first type of mechanisms. And then the second type uh, regards the, the channel linking trade to unemployment. The reason this is important for the informal sector relates to fact one that I mentioned earlier, namely that transitions from unemployment to informality are twice as large in Brazil as transitions from unemployment to formal. Um, so what happens uh, in, in this model is as an economy liberalize, uh, liberalizes and more resources uh, uh, shift towards exporters, uh, exporters on one hand tend to be larger firms, and so larger firms tend to be more stable, they have lower turnover. So that would increase, that would tend to decrease turnover. But at the same time, uh, exporters uh, are more sensitive. So that's the sensitivity effect. So <clears throat> the reallocation of resources towards exporters also means that they may become more sensitive. And what happens to unemployment in the end may depend on uh, how these uh, two effects uh, uh, balance each other. Uh, you know, conditional on unemployment, there will be a tendency for um, uh, more workers to go to informality than formality. So this is the second way in which the in which trade, uh, I'm sorry, in which uh, uh, trade affects informality in this model. So there are the Mellitz type effects, and then there is the channel through unemployment. Um, we, uh, uh, this is a model with many parameters. Some of these parameters we take from the literature uh, or we take statutory values. And then the, est the, the remaining parameters, we have a remaining 27 parameters. We estimate through indirect inference using 84 uh, data moments. And I don't have much time to go over the details of the estimation, but the fit is, I, I would just say that the fit is generally uh, quite good. And we certainly, uh, it's, it's very good regarding the moments we target. Uh, so this is again, a natural point to stop. And then the, the rest of the talk can cover the, the counterfactuals, uh, which I think are quite interesting. Great, thank you, Benny. So there are a few clarifying questions on the model and uh, on uh, some related to some of the, uh, some of the data sources. So Yuan was wondering whether uh, a formal firm can have also some informal employment. And related to that, uh, a question from the audience uh, by from uh, Dea Tusha was wondering whether the informality survey says anything about the type of, you know, for basically about some partial informality where a worker would be employed earning the minimum wage. And then uh, beyond that, uh, he would also have a part employed partly as, a, as an informal worker. Um. Yeah, so, so, so these are excellent questions. Um, uh, it's certainly the case that some formal firms uh, employ informal workers. And so this is what people call the intensive margin of informality. And we don't account for this in this paper. This is one of the limitations. And, and the reason we don't account for it is simply because it, it's computationally too involved. Uh, this is already very, very involved. One of my co-authors, Gabriele Ulissea, has a paper, so his AER paper focuses on exactly this issue, on the importance of the intensive margin. But I agree it's important. Uh, uh, the second uh, question, I'm not sure. I, I would have to check or ask you know, my, my, my co-authors, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> 
Thank you. And then another question by uh, Marcelo, who was wondering uh, whether the search and matching, so it's the same for the formal and uh, informal workers. Uh, and related to that, I had a question I was wondering about the hiring costs. So they are also the same for informal and, uh, and formal firms and how this relates to the fact that uh, informal firms probably cannot post vacancies in the same way as, uh, as former firms uh, can. Yeah. So this paper has gone through many iterations. So at some point we experimented with letting the hiring costs be different uh, across firms. And, and frankly, we didn't get much action um, out of this we didn't we didn't uh, it didn't change the results in any significant way so we we tried to abstract from those features that didn't seem to make a big difference uh, uh to, to answer you know marcelo's question directly yes we we assume that the process is the same um regarding vacancies i, I mean uh, th this is generally an abstraction <laughs> uh you are right that they don't you know informal firms cannot uh, uh post vacancies in, uh, in newspapers, but with formal firms too, the idea is not that they literally post these vacancies. The idea is that they, they somehow let people know that there is there these vacancies and people come to them. So we think of this as an abstract uh, concept rather than actual posting. Okay, there are two other questions that which are related to the stylized facts, but maybe we can defer them to the to discussion at the end, and uh, so you can now finish with the contributions. Okay, um, thank you. So in, in in the remaining time, I will try to focus on some uh, uh, counterfactuals. And so just to give you a, a sense of the kind of insights that you can generate with this model. Uh, so there are two types of counterfactuals we consider. So the first in the first set we keep the benchmark of informality constant. So we take that level of informality as given, right? And then we ask the question, what happens in this economy when we liberalize? And in the second set of counterfactuals, we'll change the, the informality. So we'll, we'll um, change enforcement or we, we'll consider what happens if we have no informality. So let me start with the first set. Okay, so in this economy where we have informality, what are the implications of um, opening up to trade. Um, we ended up in this paper, and again, there have been many iterations, but we ended up focusing on the case where we reduce iceberg trade costs, not tariffs. And the reason for that is in 2003, the tariffs in Brazil were already very low. They were 12%. So if we change tariffs, there is not much happening. There is something happening, but it's just too, too small to be of interest. On the other hand, with trade costs, um, we get... Uh, uh, much more interesting results. So in these counterfactuals that I will show you, so the, we start, uh, the, the status quo is a, is a, corresponds to the trade cost of 2.5. And then trade liberalization reduces these costs. So if, it's, if they are 1.5, we are close to free trade. If we increase them to six, we almost have altered in this model. So the first question we ask is, so what happens to the share of informality as we liberalize? Um, and uh, this is one of the most robust results in the paper. As you liberalize, as you decrease trade costs, informality in the manufacturing sector goes sharply down. If you increase trade costs, then informality will go up. Okay, so this seems to replicate the finding in the, the paper by McCake and Pouchnik, namely that if you have a country that opens up to trade, then you have resources moving to the formal manufacturing sector. Okay, this, this, replic this graph corresponds to exactly this insight. But now, if you look at what happens in the service sector, there you observe exactly the opposite pattern. Namely, as you liberalize, you increase the share of informality in the service sector, right? And so intuitively what happens here, I'll try to give you some intuition. As I said, there are many different forces operating. But in the manufacturing sector, what happens essentially is you have a, a reduction uh, in the demand for purely domestic firms. Uh, so low productivity uh, formal firms exit. And so that may increase informality, but at the same time, low productivity informal firms exit. And this second effect dominates. So you have massive exit of informal, of low productive informal firms, uh, massive exit of them, and that generates this pattern in the manufacturing sector. On the other hand, in the service sector, you have entry of low productivity informal firms. And this 
low productivity informal firms generate an, uh, in the aggregate an increase in informality. Okay, so this is the, the very sharp increase you see here. So if we look at the economy as a whole, then you see this pattern, which is non-monotonic. So depending on the magnitude of the liberalization, you may get an increase at the beginning and then a decrease. And then for you know a, a very large decrease in informality in, in uh, trade liberalization in trade costs, essentially informality and the aggregate informality in the economy does not change. So so one um, uh, conclusion one may draw from this graph is that this first part corresponds exactly to what uh, McCaig and Pachnik documented for the Vietnam and the common wisdom that structural that the trade aids structural transformation. However, this graph, the last part, uh, corresponds to what is documented widely in developing countries and especially by the World Bank, namely that in the aggregate, informality doesn't go down. And the simple answer in our framework is that what happens is that, uh, yes, uh, informality goes down in the manufacturing sector, but the service sector is four times as large as the manufacturing sector, and there actually informality goes up, and that's because you have all these low productivity firms, aggregate demand increases, and that generates this demand for, for, for more firms and you have all these low productivity informal firms entering. Uh, then uh, what happens to unemployment and welfare? Okay, so these are important because these were uh, part of, of our motivation for working on this paper. So what we find is that if you liberalize, the unemployment rate goes up significantly. And the driving force behind this result is what I mentioned before about exporters, you, so on one hand, trade uh, shifts resources towards large firms, and these firms tend to be more stable. Okay. On the other hand, exporters tend to be much more volatile, much more sensitive to shocks. And so you get this increase in the unemployment rate. One thing that's actually very interesting is that if you look at the service sector, okay, in the service sector, we don't have exporters. There, this uh, size effect dominates. So actually, turnover in the service sector goes down. And because of that, the unemployment rate, because of the presence of the service sector, the unemployment rate is not as high as it would have been in a model without the service sector. And so one uh, conclusion we drew from this paper is that it's important to, uh, to, to, to model informality, but it's equally important, if not more important, to also always take into account the service sector. Because if we don't take into account the service sector, then the picture we may obtain about the economy as a whole may, may be uh, very misleading. Another result that we think is very interesting, and that again is one of the most robust results in the paper, is that despite the increase in unemployment, uh, real income goes up. Uh, we compute two measures of welfare. One is real income, and one is real income taking into account the dis disutility of unemployment. And even if you take into account the disutility of unemployment, real income still goes up. And the reason for that is what will come next is namely the effects of trade on productivity. Okay, this is again, nothing new to a trade economist. This is probably something we are all trained uh, to, to see and to believe that trade increases aggregate TFP. So coming back to the previous graph, what happens is as, we, as the economy liberalizes, aggregate TFP goes up significantly. And so the effect is so large that despite the increase in unemployment, in the end, we have an increase in real income. However, uh, there are also some very interesting patterns here regarding the, the change in aggregate TFP. And let me, let me uh, focus here on the manufacturing sector. Uh, if you focus on the formal manufacturing sector, and again, this is what most papers in the trade literature do, because this is what we can measure. You document, we document an, an increase in aggregate TFP, a significant increase by 12%. However, if you take into account the informal sector and you compute for the whole manufacturing sector, the increase in TFP, the increase in TFP is substantially larger, is 31% in our model. Wow. So orders of magnitude larger. And the reason for that in this model is because the, uh, as, as uh, the economy liberalized, liberalizes many informal firms that tend to be small and unproductive exit. And so that adds to the productivity effect. So in short, uh, taking informality into account magnifies the effect on aggregate TFP in the manufacturing sector. If you look in the, uh, at the service sector, actually we have the opposite pattern. Again, aggregate TFP goes up, but here, if we take into account the informal sector, then the aggregate TFP goes up by less. And the reason for that is what I mentioned earlier, that as the economy liberalizes and demand goes up, uh, many 
uh, low productivity in formal firms enter. So you get entry at this uh, the left tail of the distribution. And so the aggregate TFP in the service sector is lower than it would have been if we had focused only on, on the formal service sector. So despite this effect on the service sector, if we take both uh, sectors together, we still document a very large increase in aggregate TFP. What about wage inequality? So the effects on wage inequality are very interesting in this model. And this is another case where the, mod the results we get with informality are very different from the results one gets uh, without the informal sector. And so let me uh, tell you what happens in the manufacturing sector. So importantly here, when we talk about inequality, inequality here is driven by inequality across firms because workers are homogeneous. Okay, so um, what happens here if we liberalize, then inequality increases. And this is again, partly driven by the shift of resources towards larger firms, towards exporter firms. Our model generates the size wage premium and the exporter wage premium. So as resources uh, shift towards this part of the market, then wages go up uh, at the high end and that increases inequality. And this is perfectly consistent with the results documented in many papers in the world of Help Fund and others, by, uh, among others, and also the, the paper that I mentioned, Kosar and Todd. However, if you look at the informal sector, then you see exactly the opposite effect. So there, inequality actually goes down. And this is because at the, at the low end of the distribution, many informal firms in manufacturing exit. These were, these were firms that were paying very low wages. And then many formal firms exit, but re-enter as informal firms. These are firms that pay high wages. So as a result, the, the inequality in the informal sector gets compressed. And so if you look at what happens in the overall tradable sector, actually inequality goes uh, down when you liberalize. So this is a case where the results are literally uh, reversed if you take into account um, the informal sector. Um, and um, uh, I'm almost out of time. So let me just, uh, uh, so the, the conclusion from all this is that it's very important when you consider the, the um, effects of, of trade liberalizations to take into account the informal sector, because while it's still the, the result that the trade increases real income is robust and the result that the trade increases aggregate productivity is robust, but actually regarding the magnitude of these effects, the, the implications are very different when you take into account informality and with wage inequality, actually the results are reversed. The final thing we do in the paper, there are many other counterfactuals, but let me briefly mention another counterfactual that's very uh, interesting, is we also consider now the case of where uh, the, the governments may target informality. So they may um, uh, 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 enforce informality, uh, they may enforce regulations more strictly, so that would tend to depress informality. So this is a scenario we call stricter enforcement, or they may in the extreme, just to get some sense of what the effects would be, is let's say we didn't have informality at all. Suppose, suppose the government managed to eliminate informality. Then we ask the question, so what would happen in that economy? And we have several counterfactuals in the paper regarding this case. Let me you know, show you one here in particular that, that's quite interesting. So we consider the case where you have a negative productivity shock, 1.5% uh, or negative 3% in this economy. So the blue line gives the benchmark case. So this is the case with the current level of informality. The red line gives you what happens when you have stricter enforcement. And the, the dark line, the black line, tells us what happens if we didn't have informality at all. And so if you compare the uh, first and second panels, the first and second graphs, you see this unemployment buffer effect that I talked about. So without informality, that's the black line, the unemployment shoots up. Uh, with stricter enforcement, it goes up, not as much, but it does go up. If we have the current level of informality, actually unemployment goes down. It goes down because actually informality shoots up. You know, it goes way up. So here you see this trade-off I talked about in the uh, at the beginning between informality and unemployment. So informality seems to be acting as an unemployment buffer. But on the other hand, let's see what happens to real income. Uh, so if you look at what happens to real income, perhaps surprisingly, the worst case scenario here is what happens with the current level of informality. So that's the blue line. That's where real income declines the most. 
And on the other hand, if you have stricter enforcement of informality, it still declines, but not as much. And if you have the no informality at all, again, real income declines, but by not as much as it would decline with the current level of informality. So this is despite what happens with unemployment. So why is that the case? So simply the answer for this pattern is what happens to productivity. And if I had time, I would show you the associated graph. So in this case where informality goes up, as informality shoots up, aggregate TFP goes way down and that depresses real income. While in this case, where, uh, uh, where uh, we don't allow for informality, unemployment goes up, but actually aggregate TFP goes up. So it's the extreme case of creative destruction. <laughs> um, so the productivity uh, shock is a negative, is a substantial negative shock. We have higher unemployment, but it leads to reallocation of resources in a way that actually um, uh, uh, increases aggregate TFP. And as a result of this increase in TFP, you see a less pronounced decrease in real income. So the conclusion from that is that yes, it seems that informality is an unemployment buffer, but it's not a welfare buffer. So actually the country seems to be doing worse off when we uh, allow for informality. So to conclude, uh, our conclusion from this work is that it's important to, to, to model the informal sector and also the non-tradable sector. Um, we hope that what we did uh, has convinced you that uh, so, so we only we have only begun to scratch the surface it's an extremely complicated issue and there is a lot of work to be done but we we, we think that one of our contributions is that we we managed to replicate some of the patterns that were documented in work based on different dips so in particular we we can replicate this fact that trade openness will leads to a decline in informality in the tradable sector so that's the McCaig and Pachnik finding. You also find that the informal sector has an employment buffer. This is, these are the results by the Carnero and Kovac and also by Ulis and Pochnik. Uh, but there are also some new insights that you cannot get out of different diff. So we uh, uh, find that if you look at aggregate informality, the effect of trade on informality is actually ambiguous and that may explain what the World Bank has documented. We do find that the informal sector does not uh, act as a welfare buffer, it acts as an unemployment, unemployment buffer, but not as a, as a welfare buffer. Um, and finally, you know, in some other counterfactuals we do, we find that if a country, if a government represses informality, that tends to increase productivity, but then um, uh, uh, aggregate welfare, real income takes a big hit. While what we show is that trade can achieve the same productivity gains while increasing welfare. So, uh, you know, trade liberalization seems a very cheap, it's by far superior way to increase productivity compared to completely suppressing uh, informality. We find that trade increases wage inequality in the formal tradable sector. That's again, consistent with previous findings, but we, to remind you, we find that this effect is reversed when we include the informal uh, sector. And we also find that the effect on productivity is uh, understated in the tradable sector if we don't take into account the informal sector. And finally, one of the most robust findings um, across many scenarios is that trade leads to uh, large welfare gains, and this is uh, robust to uh, 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 suppressing informality. And it's also robust to what exactly welfare measure we use, even for, when we take into account the disutility of unemployment, we still get very large positive effects of trade on welfare. So I will stop here and thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Penny, for this super clear and fascinating presentation. So now is the time where the audience can ask questions. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand and then we'll uh, unmute you so that you can ask your questions. Uh, in the meantime, I know there is a question by Frederic and then Marcelo. So uh, please uh, go ahead. So did you pass me the, the, the microphone? Yeah, okay, sorry. So thank you very much. Um, I have, sorry, uh, let me just ask one of the two questions uh, in the interest of time. So in, um, in the model, real income is welfare because workers are risk neutral. Do you have a, a scenario where you allow for a concave utility function because with 
with unemployment, um, then unemployment uh, matters per se beyond the effect on, on real wages? That, that, that's a great question. And I'm afraid the answer is no, we don't allow for it. Uh, simply because I cannot, I, I cannot convey how <laughs> computationally uh, uh, complex, how complex this model is. But, 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 but you are right that this, this, this is a very important issue. So all we do um, at present is we account for the disutility of, of unemployment. But, you, but, but we don't account for, uh, th there's no risk aversion in the model, and nothing beyond that. Thanks. So maybe maybe a, a, a follow up question on on Fred. So and it has to do with this welfare buffer that um, that is is not there. Um, um, so the the when when the worker um, moves from informality to unemployment, um, does he does it's real income. Does he has an, an outside option when he's unemployed? An outside income, the, the, the social benefit? So if they're formal, then they, they do. Uh, so, but if they're informal, there is nothing. Um, so Zero. There is, okay. Right. And, and there, is, then, there is a strong disutility of, of unemployment. Right. But the, the, then the, the welfare. So the welfare bar buffer is um, that there is no welfare buffer is for the average individual, right? Uh, right. So so we do. So uh, the obviously there is a, a, a force that depresses real income because their right. unemployment goes up. So this is lost income. But the, the reason, and again, welfare goes down. Welfare doesn't go up. Well, right. if you have a negative productivity shock, welfare does go down. No, I see. Usually, it doesn't go down as much is because TFP increases. So, for those firms that remain on the market, okay, the, the firms that remain on the market tend to be the more productive firms. So right. there is a there is a TFP gain through these firms. No, but my question my question is whether when when, when we are talking about welfare and uh, whether we shouldn't uh, distinguish between um, the unemployed, the informal workers. And the and the, the the employed workers, whether we shouldn't be some sort of I know you look at into inequality, but uh, the welfare of whom? Because it, it it seems to me, for example, when if you're going to make if, if you're going to uh, get rid of informality in those simulations, uh, then the guys are going to get go to zero incomes. So those guys are clearly not going to be better off. So it, it depends who who we're talking. Yeah, I agree. So this, when I say it's not a welfare uh, buffer, this refers to the average, right? It's to the average uh, consumer worker. You know, it doesn't it doesn't refer to the unemployed. Okay. Uh, just to be clear, we don't advocate that the the, the government uh, represses informality in the paper. So there is another counterfactual where we say, what happens if so? That has nothing to do with trade. We say, what happens? if they repress informality completely. And what we find without informality, so, so even without negative productivity shocks, uh, TFP goes way up as you would expect and welfare goes down. So the, actually uh, this is a case where real income goes down quite substantially actually. Um, but what's interesting is in that scenario, productivity goes up by the same percentage that you get with trade liberalization. Right, and that's why we say in trade liberalization, you get the same productivity gain in the in the in the current in the current uh, scenario with the current level of informality. You get the same increase in productivity, and at the same time, you get a welfare gain. Right, while if you repress informality, you get the productivity increase and you you depress welfare. So by no means is that you should not interpret this finding as a, you know as as making the case for uh, eliminating informality. We just make the point that uh, you get very large increases, TFP increases in the case where you don't have informality. That's thank you, thank you very much. So thank you very much, Penny, again. Uh, I'm afraid we are out of time. So thank you to all the participants uh, for participating in the GTDW. We look forward to seeing you on November 15th, where we'll be hosting uh, Amit Kandeval. And so thank you again uh, very much and see you next time. Thank you, Penny. Thank you.
Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye.